context. The Athene had a talent for condescension. A talent that's only really been matched since by, well, the English. My lot have historically considered all foreigners, barbarians, and our more immediate neighbours, such as the Irish, Welsh, Scottish, Northerners, or indeed any living soul outside London, as bumbling clodhoppers with odd heathen ways. Athens shared a similar attitude towards Macedonia, even, as we shall see, after Macedonia had conquered Athens' effete ass. This was compounded by a strong sense of the merits of Greek democracy over Macedonian monarchy. So the fact that Aristotle was the son of the physician to the royal Macedonian court made him, from the outset perhaps, a little bit too earthy for rarefied Athenian palates. So when Aristotle's guardian and brother-in-law finally got the orphan little tyke off his hands by sending him at the age of 16 to study at Plato's Academy in Athens, it was a case of Aristotle's undoubted brilliance versus his being, well, a bit of a yokel. An exemplary student and valued teacher, no doubt, but not quite on board with the forms, don't you know? Which is why when, 20 years later, Plato brought down the curtain and joined the choir eternal, Aristotle did not, much to his chagrin, get Plato's job. Cue his huffing off to Turkey for a spot of empirical paddling, and then to Macedonia to teach some kid called Alexander. A few years later, Alexander ruled the world. So under Alexander's patronage, Aristotle got to return to Athens and set up an alternative to the Haiti Tighty Academy. This Lyceum was a much more empirical and down-to-earth affair, more looking at things and writing stuff down than rational contemplation and intuiting gilded memories. The empiricism and pragmatism of Aristotle's institution did little, however, to calm Athenian fears about horny-handed sons of the soil corrupting the purity of abstract Athenian ideals. So when Alexander snuffed it in 323 BC, Aristotle was charged with impiety. Aristotle took the hint, re Socrates' fate, and fled to an island in the Med, whereupon within a year he was dead. Good grief, I'm talking in verse. Content. Starting from the observable world of things, Aristotle sets out to explain existence, identity, and change. Firstly, by numbering the ways we tend to explain things. So, we say of a thing that it is the way that it is, one, because of what it's made of, what Aristotle called its material cause, two, because of its structure, what Aristotle called its formal cause, three, because of what moves it, which Aristotle called its efficient cause, and four, because of what it aims to do, which Aristotle called its final cause. So a pair of scissors, for example, can be explained in terms of the hard material they're made of, their structure with handles, a pivot and two blades, the efforts of those who made them and of the job they were made to do. And it's from such explanations of everyday objects that Aristotle's account of existence, his ontology, emerges. According to him, the essence of an extant thing, like a pair of scissors, is its substance by which he means its material structure, the structure by virtue of which it is what it is, in this case a pair of scissors. Substance, according to Aristotle, is how we identify things. Contrary to Plato, however, Aristotle takes these structures or forms to depend on the matter which actualizes them. He also took them to be observable and vulnerable to change, this was doubtless anathema to Plato and hardly conducive to the general aim of his academy. Meanwhile, every extant thing that is not a substance was, according to Aristotle, accidental. That is, possessed of mere secondary features that are unnecessary for its being what it is. The colour of a pair of scissors, for example. From this ontology, Aristotle goes on to present his account of change, his cosmology. He says that when a thing changes, like when an acorn becomes an oak tree, the accruing matter is preserved, whilst transitional forms, for example seedlings, sapling and so forth, are first created and then destroyed by the action of some external motivator. 
such as the processes of nourishment or growth. This sequence of forms is undertaken so as to attain the final form of a mature oak tree. The process of change then, according to Aristotle, is one in which the potential of matter to attain the form of its final cause is actualized by efficient causes. This, rather than a confusingly cobbled together bunch of lecture notes, plonked during the 3rd century AD on a recommended reading list after his books on physics, is Aristotle's metaphysics. Consequence The back and forth between Platonists who take the rudiments of existence to be immaterial entities understood via pure reason and Aristotelians who have a more empirical and practical approach to accounting for existence and change has been the stage upon which nearly two and a half millennia of Western metaphysics has played out. Broadly as a result there are three metaphysical camps. Those who tend towards Plato, for example Neoplatonists like Plotinus or Augustine, or continental rationalists like Descartes and Leibniz. Those who tend towards synthesizing Plato and Aristotle, for example the critical metaphysics of Kant, and those who tend towards Aristotle, for example scholastics like Aquinas or British empiricists like Locke and Hume. Pretty much all Western metaphysics to this day, and thus Western philosophy, can thereby be plotted on an axis rooted in the political machinations of ancient Athens. In future episodes of this series, I'll be working my way through that history towards the present day. On the way, you'll probably recognise many issues with a direct bearing on familiar disputes, like the existence of God, the nature of morality, or the best approach to politics. So until next time, thank you for listening.